The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Shu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hello, Datables. Welcome to another episode of the Datable Podcast, where it is our mission, Julie and I, to help you figure out why people do the things they do, why they say the things that they say, and then how you can navigate it all in this world called modern dating. Ooh, that's a lot. <laughs> I love- We come full circle. I know. And we are taking a trip back in time. We are traveling back to 2004 when the book He's Just Not That Into You was released. We have Greg Barrent, who is the author that, you know, I'm sure pretty much any, everyone has heard the phrase, he's just not that into you. It started with Sex of the City. He was a writer on the show, became a book, became a movie. And I feel like it was like the words of wisdom that many women listen to. And I would say debatably, we could argue that now it just is should be they are just not that into you because I think the same thing applies to all genders, all sexualities, all of that. We loved this movie so much when it came out, (laughs) simply because it gave you so many answers to why is this person doing things this way or said this? Because Often in dating, what we're trying to do is win the other person over, but we're ignoring all the signs and they're very clear. And frankly, people are pretty honest on the first couple of dates. So this movie was eye opening for me because by the end of it, I was like, that's it. I'm wasting my time with people who are not into me. Yeah, I mean, I think I really it. I definitely like the movie, but in the Sex of the City, you know, I'm a huge Sex of the City fan, but I feel like it when Miranda got that intel from Carrie's boyfriend at the time, Burger, for all the Sex of the City fans, her mind was just blown because she's like, I have Mm -hmm. wasted so many hours, you know, like analyzing and overthinking and debating if someone likes me or not, or if they were going to call, if they were going to make the next move, all that stuff, where... It it could be just that simple. If you take what someone's saying or what they're not saying, I think that's the key. The inaction is just as important as the action at face value. Mm -hmm. And, And in this interview, we get to hear it from Greg himself, because did you know that Greg is the person behind this book, behind this saying? Can you believe it? And he's... Um, he is a hetero man who's been married for many years. He was a writer on Sex and the City. He's the one that came up with this idea that was so simple and intuitive to him and to the women around him were just so mind blown yeah. by the entire thing. So it's really funny to hear it from his perspective. It is. But, you know, I feel like there is the simplification, but there's clearly a lot of nuance in life, which is why we have the whys and why we have the hows. But we had a big week last week and I feel like I'm just like, kind of taking a breather now, but we sold out our Finding Your Person program. So we're very excited. We're super pumped to work with all the people that signed up. We have 50 folks in the program, which was our max capacity. And, you know, we're ready to go and help them on their journey, that adventure. That was a whirlwind of a launch because we had been prepping for this for years, but we never knew how it was going to be received until launch week Mm -hmm. came. And I think it makes us so happy to see so many of you are excited to be part of this program, but also for those of you who are still debating, maybe want to take some time first before joining, you still have a chance because if you go to findingyourperson.com now, you can join the next wait list and we'll let you know when we open up the program again. Mm -hmm. So you didn't miss your chance completely. But also congrats to all the people who joined this one because you got in right on time. The reality is we're not quite sure when it's going to launch again. I think part of it is we want to run through this program at least once with the folks and, you know, learn from it too. But I think just getting in the loop because it did sell out relatively quickly. I mean, we had to like pull in our date because we just had too much demand. So if you are on the edge or you're not on the wait list yet, you can still join findingyourperson.com. It's all there, except you unfortunately cannot sign up anymore. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it's okay. Just get on our list anyway. You'll get all the good stuff. We promise. Uh, some of the other fun things just been happening is 
I think this is spurring up a lot of debate on what does finding your person even mean? We've gotten a lot of DMs and emails, Mm. people thinking, I'm really interested in this program because I am really interested in finding my person. We put up a poll on Instagram that asked, would you rather find a connection or would you rather find love? Mm. And 90% of people said, I'd rather find a connection. Interesting. And I think that's very telling because love is almost this idea, and but connection is something very tangible and until you find connection, you can't really find love yet. Yeah, I was I saw some of the responses saying they were one and the same. And I'm not quite sure I agree with that. Mm. I don't know. I guess it's just maybe it's how you define love. Because I think you can love people that you don't feel connected to. And you could feel connected yes. to people that you don't necessarily love. I also feel like love takes a while to get mm. there. But connection can happen pretty fast. And I think love is the next step to a stronger connection. So I think Yes, they're one the same once you're at that stage. But in the beginning, I think a a strong connection is definitely the most important thing. Absolutely. Um, Yeah, it's a there was also another really interesting debate on Instagram and Facebook, we put up a quote around like, find someone that is obsessed with you. I think it's like slightly different. That sounds super creepy when I say it out loud. (laughs) No, I think that is it. Was it? But it is creepy you when deser- you say it okay, out loud. You deserve someone who is utterly obsessed with you. Obsessed I with actually, you, yeah. Okay, so I hear what people are saying. You don't want someone that you need to get restraining orders on. I, <laughs> I don't think anyone's saying that that's a good situation. We all want someone that has a life of their own also. Like, all that's a given. I think where the sentiment of it is coming from that I think a lot – that resonated with a lot of people because, yeah, there were the people that kind of commented like that, but I would say also – got a ton of people being like hell yeah like this is what i want tons of like interaction compared to other posts we put on and likes etc and i think the sentiment that resonates with me is someone that you know just feels lucky to freaking be with you like the same way that you feel Mm -hmm. lucky to be with them that's what i think it means not restraining order no one's advocating for that here (laughs) it's a fuck yes mentality and i think we say obsessed in a way that is a very trendy way of saying not like obsessed like crazy but someone who is just so into you but it has to be reciprocated you also have to be obsessed with them too i think that's what is the missing sentence yes Yes. (laughs) can't be a one-way street and i think it needs to be healthy too i think the point of like it can't be like yes i want someone who thinks I'm their world for sure. But they also need to have other planets orbiting too. It can't just be me either. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can see it just a one way obsession. And that would just not be good. Nope. That's why there's so many movies being made about that. But I think ultimately, when you have these insecurities about someone you're dating, because they're not yeah. texting you back or you're not hearing from them. No matter what's going on in their life and what their intentions are, it's impacting you in a way that's negative, right? Mm-hmm. So you don't feel like they're that into you. So why would you want to be with someone and give someone the time when they're just not as into you as you are into them? No. Right? Why wouldn't you just move on? Absolutely. And I think like a big, I don't know, I, I actually went to a bachelorette party this weekend in Palm Springs, which was super fun to- to, you know, mm-hmm. be, I feel like I haven't been out. We went to a gay club. That was super fun. But I think one of the revelations I had, we were talking about it. And this is a friend I've known since I moved to San Francisco. So, you know, coming on 12 years now. And I wow. knew her before her current partner that she's getting married to. But they've been together for seven years. And like, at, at, on one side, I totally see seven years because they've built, you know, a foundation and a relationship and a partnership also in a life. But then the other side, I'm like, wow, we're Where did seven years go? That feels like it has been not that long, you know? But what it was, it served for me was a real kind of a reminder that it takes time. Like, I think sometimes we're Mm -hmm. trying to rush everything. And the reality is it takes time to get to know someone. It takes time to build a life with someone. I think the older you get, sometimes it can happen faster just because you are more comfortable with like who you are and what you want and all that stuff. But I also don't think it means that like you have to run 
run at like rampant speed either. There's nothing wrong with taking your time and the fact that like this is another person that you're getting to know and sometimes it just takes time. And I think in dating, we just don't give enough time. And that's what makes it hard because there's just so many choices and so many people out there. And I'm not saying like if someone's treating you shitty, you should give it more time. But I think if it's not, you know, I'm in love after, you know, even month six, I feel like that's okay. Like I think that could grow as long as, you know, the connection is there and it's you're seeing the progression. Yeah, I had this, um, we had a very tumultuous a conversation with my mom. So my mom came over for dinner, my mom and my dad, and you can tell she was working up her nerves oh God. to ask us something oh God. in the middle of dinner. So my boyfriend and I are, you know, finishing up the end of dinner. We're having a great conversation and you just see her take a deep breath. And I was like, oh shit, here it comes. And of course, it's the question of when are you guys going to get married and have kids? And I I jokingly asked her, I said, mom, you can only choose one. Which would it be? And she said, I want both. <laughs> I want both. And she was very adamant that she wanted these things. So anyway, it it all worked out because it helped us have this open discussion. And something I realized was was this. In relationships and dating, yes, it's good to look forward to something and Mm -hmm. have milestones, but you can't have your future disrupt your present. If this anxiety over a future milestone is ruining what you currently have, then you need to stop worrying about that future milestone. And I I told her that and I said, you are bringing in f- the future to interrupt something really great in the present right now. So I like this idea of time and being on your own time. As long as you see progression and you're building towards something, it doesn't matter what those milestones are and don't let that pressure you. So now she's like, I feel good about that. You know, she's like, I feel good about that conversation. I'm so glad. So were you able to think up that response in the moment? Because I feel like I would just have got a defensive. <laughs> yes. So the way I told that story was fast forwarded <laughs> that night. I was like, wait, that sounded very chill for the, the setup. That night, we didn't even finish our dinner. My parents packed their <gasps> shit and they just left because they felt so awkward. My boyfriend's washing dishes and he just looks so irritated. And I'm irritated by everyone because I'm like, I'm stuck in the middle here. My parents want one thing. My boyfriend doesn't want one thing. I'm in the middle. Nobody's asking me what I want. So I took a night off and I went into the guest room and I just thought about things and had a really great conversation with my partner the next day and also with my mom. And that's when I came up with this because I I was very honest about the fact that I understand that she's looking forward to these things, one, because she's (laughs) retired. But two, I think, you know, as a mom of a, a, when you're a mom and you have a daughter, these sort of things that you want for your daughter, you want her to be protected, you want Mm -hmm. her to feel safe, especially when they no longer, you know, they're, they're no longer capable of doing these things. So she's worried about that day when she is not capable and who's going to take care of me. And I told her, as long as we can take care of each other right now in the present, let's enjoy this because if we don't, we're wasting your time trying to think about this future scenario that nobody has fucking control over. Right. So I think she I think I I talked it through with her and I think I got through to her. I really hope so because she t- she promised me that was the last time she was going to bring it up. You know, I think you you're in a hard position too because you don't have siblings. I feel yes. like because there is okay, like I'm sure there is this protection piece, but I think there is a little bit of a selfish piece. And I've talked to my mom about this too. Like I think it's even hard for her that my brother and sister law don't live super close by so there is a little bit of a selfish piece and i'm not saying it's selfish in a bad way i think it's just human nature that like if it's kind of like when all your friends are getting into relationships or all your friends are getting married all your friends are having kids for them it's all their friends are having grandkids and they get to be with their grandkids and it brings up that stuff for them and i think that's totally natural that's totally natural and it's hard for you because you have no one else to deflect it (laughs) Oh, you totally get me, Julie. It is so true. Sometimes I wish I just had an older brother or sister who's already married with kids. And my parents wouldn't give a shit what I'm doing. Yeah, my mom does not give me any of that pressure, which I think is, I think she just wants me to be happy. But I think also, like, I think she thinks I like can take care of myself, which I think is good. And I think some of that is generational and changes of women and, you know, what's possible. And maybe some of it is just even giving your mom that mindset too. Like, I have this great 
great partner, but I also am pretty freaking capable on my own, you know? I've done all this stuff on my own. Like, it's not like I'm going to be incapable if something were to happen. Yeah, she did say something. She's never watched Sex in the City, but she did almost quote the show when she said, you spend your lifetime celebrating other people's life choices. When's it going to be your turn? Yeah. And I remember that episode on Sex in the City, and it made me think, well, my life choices could also be a freaking big ass 40th birthday yeah. that I never threw for myself right. and I will have a guest list and a registry. Totally. So the, we're, it's just that we're conditioned to think it has to be the wedding and the baby shower and all that stuff that we have to celebrate. Well, there are other reasons to celebrate life too. Yeah, I absolutely. I think I read a study that like people that had children, it was like the happiness level of people that had children versus ones that didn't. And, mm. you know, it actually was that people that didn't have children were more more consistently happy but then people mm. that had children had higher highs and lows oh, so yes you know like they could have intense joy but they also could have you know intense stress and not Ugh. happiness you know so i think it's just a different lifestyle and i don't think one is right or wrong it's just different life choices and i think we need to celebrate that more like celebrate even like i yeah i, I think the sex of the city where carrie did her own registry for herself with the shoes so badass but that's, it's true. It's like, why should, you know, why should people only celebrate these societal expectations? Like, it should just be celebrating whatever decision you make. Fuck yes. I'm celebrating next year. I, it won't be my 40th. It'll be my 41st. But a better reason to celebrate is my 41st fucking birthday. Okay. Yes. It's gonna happen. We're going to Vegas, right? <laughs> <laughs> or, I don't know, somewhere better, yeah. Julie. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's your birthday. We'll do whatever you want. Do whatever you we'll want. We'll do whatever. But I really want to go to Vegas. Is that what you're saying? Like, let's but do yeah, it. Do yeah, I think Vegas. we should do Vegas now. <laughs> no, I think it's going to be good. And we are going to celebrate this week. UA and I will be reunited in SF, Yay. which will be phenomenal. Like we said, we've been busting our ass to do this program. And we're excited to just, you know, go to dinner and celebrate tomorrow night. Uh, and then our partners get to meet. Oh, yeah. Later we're in gonna the week, too. We're going to have a double too, date. Which will be fun. <laughs> double date. We'll let you all know know how it goes maybe we'll post some photos we'll see we'll see how we're feeling. i don't know if my partner was like that. just saying up front we'll like put like an emoji yeah i was gonna her. say we can put emojis over their head it's fine like they're celebrities so so basically it's you and i in a photo exactly exactly with uh emojis but it's good it'll be good i've had so many great life conversations this week because i've caught up with girlfriends who recently had babies and they've said the same thing as you julia the highs are really high and the lows are really fucking low and the lows get to a point where they didn't even realize they could go that low so i get it this is everything in life and this is something i heard recently was um live in the live in a state of impermanence Mm -hmm. just know that everything is sort of changeable and everything is changing and evolving. So whatever situation you're in right now, it's going to change. Right. It's never going to be like this forever. So when you're in your highs, know that it doesn't stay there. When you're in your lows, it, know it doesn't stay there. Know that when you're anxious about someone not texting you back, know that it passes. And yes. if you're going through a heartbreak, it's also impermanent. It, you're, it's all going to pass and we're in a constant state of change. And I think that is just so liberating to acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. And I think with this episode too, what I love about this is you know I think I think sometimes we say we say things are shades of gray and they shouldn't be this black and white but I do think if someone's not showing up for you it almost is that Mm -hmm. black and white like there's other parts of relationships that are shades of gray but I think the basic you know the basic showing up especially in the early stages that shouldn't be that's that is very Mm -hmm. black and white someone you know is into it or they're not and if they're not for whatever reason like I feel like we're people's people our agents we always talk about that oh always. they're too busy or they just got out of a relationship then let them be busy let them deal with their heartbreak and if they're ready then they'll come back around when they're ready to give it their all i think that's so mm-hmm. much better than you know taking crumbs like the breadcrumbs that someone's giving you when they're just not fully in yeah and it, know that it's not personal no. it may have nothing to do with you it may just be whatever they're going through right now and it just does not involve you in the picture 
And that is okay. And it's freeing to know that. Yeah. So you can move on. I talked about this with our Finding Your Person program. But when I was back in Boston over COVID in the winter time, I met mm-hmm. someone virtually and we talked on the phone, like we talked on video chat, we talked on text like all the time. I like thought I found my person. I think I like mm-hmm. texted you this, yep. which sounds so dumb in retrospect, but I think a lot of people went it's not dumb. I think a lot of people no. went through this with virtual. I think vir- all virtual could really fuck with you. <laughs> that's my that's my opinion. But I think I really thought that there was something. We were counting down the days till I got home back to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'll meet you at the airport with balloons. Like it was this whole thing. <laughs> and then he just fell off the face of the universe. And he just mm-hmm. became too busy. Work was too busy. There were family issues, like everything. And it's it's like if someone can't find an hour to meet up with you when they claim they want to so badly, they they just don't want it that bad. And maybe there was something mm-hmm. going on in his life. Like I, I just don't know, obviously. But I think we're like kind of netted out with it was like, okay, if things change for you, like let me know, but I'm moving forward. And I guess spoiler alert, I never he never let me know. So I guess that was kind of Well, you never met up. No, right? we never met up. Which is a crazy we part. We never because met up. No. You were already developing feelings for this person. And it, it was seems the start reciprocal of too. It seemed very reciprocal, at least through there, you know? It was crazy. But where I'm going with this is with my current partner from day one, it was just easy. Like it Mm -hmm. was none of this, you know, and I think until you see that it puts everything else in perspective that if someone really wants one, they're ready for a relationship and two, they like you, Mm -hmm. they're going to make it happen like they because they want to make it happen. There's no excuse. Yep. And it shows when you're ready to find your person. I know I've been through phases where I thought, oh, this seems too easy. And I feel like Mm. there should be more of a chase. I I feel like I should be guessing more Then I. I knew that I was not ready Mm. to be in a relationship. So a lot of this is not just you learning about the other person. You're also learning about yourself. So be curious and observe how you're dealing with the situation. Yeah. Question? Yeah, let's do our question. Question is another situation. (laughs) situation ships that we've been talking about this one's related to this episode like they all of these questions are but this is a another one of those popular questions which is how do you know when the person you're dating is not into you or is playing hard to get Mm -hmm. situation ships that is the worst term in dating i think yes i love that that's even a question that is this person really not into me or they're just so into me that they're making an effort to show that they're not into me? Like, how can the, the these two situations be on the same plane? I don't even know. So this question in itself bothers me to no extent because I've been here a million times. <laughs> I've asked exact same thing. But ultimately, I think the answer is, how does this person make you feel? If you feel like you're not desired or wanted or this person is even making time to be with you, it doesn't matter if they're playing hard to get or they're not into you because they're not meeting your needs. And so this question is a moot point. Yes, I was going to say it almost doesn't matter. And I think too, it's do you want someone that you can't text? I think I always thought about that when, you know, women aren't supposed to text back or initiate texts or wait three days or all the stupid BS. Do you want someone that you are thinking about when you should land your text message? I don't. Is that the type of person you want in a relationship? Because I think early dating, yes, you don't know the person as well. And everyone's kind of on their best behavior a little. But I think the more real you can be in early stage dating, the less surprises there are (laughs) once things actually develop. And I think it doesn't almost matter if it's coming from a place of them being playing hard to get or just, you know, be in a bad time. I think people play up timing so much that it's mm-hmm. they're busy, there's something going on in their life. It almost doesn't matter. The The reality is they're not giving you the time you need right this minute. That's the mm-hmm. reality, whether they like you or not. So I personally think if you aren't getting what you need from someone, it's sharing that. And if they just don't like you, then it will be like, okay, well, you know, they either ghost you or they say that, you know, it wasn't a fit or whatever. And if they did like you, then on the the pro side, it could snap them into better behavior, you know, at the minimum, they could at least reach out later. Or, you know, maybe it's just not a fit because you're not compatible of how you view relationships and time. 
Think about it. Your early dating stages are to observe if that person would make a good partner、mm-hmm. for when you're in a relationship. So why would it make sense to not text someone or have someone not text you because they're playing hard to get? Be a good indicator、no. of them being a good partner later in life. Because do you really want to be with someone who takes three days to text you back because they're trying to win you over? No, it doesn't. Relationships don't work like that. And if you have to play games to be with someone, your entire relationship. Will be a fucking game, and no one wins in that. I remember in New York when I was obsessed with that guy that broke my heart. We we had a a revisit a year later or something, and I remember I just poured my heart out to him, and he couldn't reciprocate. He couldn't say any of the words back. And that night when I went back to my place and he went back to his, as soon as he left and I went back into my apartment, someone tried to break into my、mm. apartment. Someone was trying to open the door, and I heard them like. Trying to key key my door, and I I couldn't I I couldn't text or call that guy because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm gonna come on too strong. Like I really need him in this moment, and then I thought, this is a moment when you do need someone.、Right. That was really fucking scary. So I end up calling nine one one, which is you know you should do that anyway. But it would have been nice to have someone that I could rely on, and it was so telling that that was not the person. Yeah, I think though it's good that you poured your heart out. I think a lot、mm. of people question, should I do it? Or should I just kind of wait and also play hard to get and see what happens? But I think, like we're saying, if wouldn't you rather just know? I think, like, because、yeah. if you know, okay, if let's say they really are playing hard to get, or they're not sure how you feel, that gives them permission to be like, I feel the same way. If yes, they don't yes. feel that way, it's gonna suck in the moment. But you're not gonna spend another three months or six months or however long wondering. And I think it's really hard to date other people when that person's in your Mind still, so as much、mm-hmm. as it will sting, knowing and using that knowledge and making that mental like cut off to move forward is so important. Oh, I hate that. I hate being stuck in that stage. I'd rather just know. Oh,、no, definitely, definitely. Even like when I would go on like one or two dates, I'm like, I'd rather, I'd rather be the one that reaches out to learn that it's not a fit than to wait by my phone and you know play the game. Who has time for that? Because that just allows you to move on and meet someone that's not doing any. That shit. Yeah, better use of your time, and don't forget if you find that someone's playing hard to get with you, that is not necessarily a good thing. It means they're trying、no. to win you over. It doesn't mean that they like you. It just means they're trying to win this pageant. So fuck them. They can go win another pageant if they want to. You're not part of. You're not a contestant here. It means that they're not ready for a relationship. Is what it means.、Yeah. So you're gonna find that out in three months once they finally get you. Then it will be over. So it's like you might as well move on to someone、move、that's、on. ready. Oh, Move on. Don't you love it? We're giving black and white advice, just like our guest today. He's rubbed off on us. <laughs> Before we get into the episode with Reg, quick announcements. Love in the time of Corona. That is our Facebook group. That's the public group. We have at Dateable Podcast is our Instagram handle, and then we have the Sounding Board, which is our premium community where we have our weekly sound offs now that are guided discussions with our host team. We are talking about like overcoming FODA. We have another one about communication, especially in times of conflicts. Traveling with dating. There's a lot of good ones on the roster in the next three months, and the team that leads these are freaking amazing. We also have office hour chats with UA and I, so you can drop in, ask us your burning dating questions, you know, <laughs> get that feedback. So it's great. I mean, everyone that's in the community are just incredible people. They were the ones that did the meetup in San Francisco a couple weeks、mm-hmm. ago. Definitely get in on the fun. So datablepodcast.com/soundingboard. Awesome. Let's get into a. A few quick messages from our sponsors. Do you want to get six bottles of wine for twenty nine ninety five? Oh yeah! Listen until the end of this message. Anyone who drinks wine knows the options are endless, which is why finding a wine I like can be hit or miss. But now that I'm a First Leave Wine Club member, I don't have to worry about that. If you're not familiar with First Leave, let me tell you all about it. It is a wine club that curates and ships wines that are perfect for you. And since they work with renowned winemakers from all over the world, there's virtually no limit to the variety of wines you get to try. And when you rate the wine. 
wine you receive, they learn more about your palate. And I'm having so much fun discovering wines that I would have never known about in the first place, like my current bottle of Grenache by La Douleur Exquise. I know, I sound so fancy. First Leaf is so confident you'll love the wine, they have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you receive a bottle that isn't exactly where you were hoping for, they will credit your account. Join today and you'll get six bottles of wine for $29.95 and free shipping. Just go to tryfirstleaf.com slash datable. That's six bottles of wine for $29.95 and free shipping at tryfirstleaf.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. Okay, let's hear it from Greg. In 2009, a movie came out. Can you guess what that movie was called? Because everybody watched this movie. It was called He's Just Not That Into You. And this concept was so groundbreaking that women everywhere declared, if he doesn't do this, he's just not that into you. If he doesn't do that, he's just not that into you. But I just looked back at the cast list because I kind of forgot who was in it. Jennifer Goodwin, (laughs) does she always play this character? Do you feel like this is this is just her role for life? This is all she does. Oh my god, totally. Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. Yeah. So Jennifer Goodwin, uh, Jennifer Aniston was in this movie, Jennifer Connolly, all the Jennifers were in this movie. But the person who created, who was the mastermind behind this movie is our guest today. His name is Greg Barrent. He is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, He's Just Not That Into You. Co-author. Co-author. <laughs> co-author. Yeah, I gotta say co-author. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. fine. Co-author, yeah. he's just just not that into you, uh, and it's called a breakup because it's broken, as well as it's just a fucking date and how to keep your marriage from sucking. All these titles are freaking amazing. Thank he's you. 58 years old. He lives in LA. He's been in LA for 16 years. Originally from San Francisco, I didn't know that, and he is married. Hi, Greg. Hi. How are you? Hey, Greg. We're so excited to have you. And also, Greg is the host of Don't Take Bullshit from Fuckers, which you and I were both guests on. And we had his co-host, Kate Holloway, on the podcast as well. I feel like Don't Take Bullshit from Fuckers is so your brand, Greg. I feel like that fits 100% with all your book titles. It is my brand. I like <laughs> I like it if the answer is in the title. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like it so you know, really don't have to explain a lot. Don't take bullshit from fuckers. I was on a plane ride recently, and one of the movie options was He's Just Not That Into You. So I watched the movie very recently, Uh and I actually like thought that I didn't realize that you were a consultant for Sex and the City, because that's where the term originally originated from. Can you tell us a little bit about the story, like of how the term came to be? Because I read it, but I would love to hear it from your words, because I think it's a good one. (laughs) It's a good, it's a good story. I mean, it's, you know, it's just one of those things that happened. I was, um, I worked as a consultant on the show for since season two, and it was the last season. And, and we were writing and we were on a lunch break. And one of the girls asked me about a guy she was seeing. And she said she'd been seeing this guy for a while and uh they, they they'd gone on like i don't know 10 dates or something wow and she invited him up to have sex and he said no he had to do something and so she said do you think that's bad and then i just stared at her and then uh <laughs> and uh <laughs> and then eventually i said um yeah it's not good it's definitely not good and, you know i just he's just not that into you and <laughs> i don't remember saying it but there was a there was a there was another person present for the conversation, who was Liz DiCillo, who's the co-author of the book. And she sort of grabbed onto the phrase and said, that's genius. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? Because he's just not that into you. And so then we went in, we went back into the writer's room, and we all started talking about it. And everybody started asking me these questions. So if a guy doesn't call you, that means he doesn't like you. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yes, that is correct. <laughs> It just seems so common sense to you. At the time, were you single? Or were you dating? I was... I think I was engaged, if not married. Oh. Okay. So you're like, it doesn't have yeah, to be yeah, yeah. this complicated. You all are just making... It just doesn't have to be that hard. Right. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that hard. And everyone's making it so complicated. And they would always find excuses for the guy of why he wasn't getting... You know, Maybe he's shy. Maybe he's intimidated. 
I mean, even in 2021, like one of the things that we want to do on this episode is take a look back in time because it was originally published in 2004 and see like what's relevant current day and what's not. But I feel like you and I come across this all the time of people being each other's like PR agents, like making this story up Mm -hmm. to justify bad Uh behavior. This is still going on current day, if not worse, because, you know, there's so many more people that are in the mix and less accountability because of dating apps or no ties to social circles, et cetera. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, we're living in a different a different structured world, but the rules are always the same. The book on based on a very basic foundation and and it still applies, you know. If you're not getting any attention from somebody, they're not interested. Right. Unless they have diarrhea, which is what happened to Miranda on sex. That's what happened to Miranda. <laughs> yeah. The guy I really, totally forgot yeah. about that episode. Really- <laughs> but why? Why? Okay. So let's back up for a sec. How did you even become a male consult for Sex in the City to begin with? What gave you that credibility? Well, that's a really good story. <laughs> the executive producer and I used to do stand up together. Mm. Oh. And and so he was just just an old buddy. <laughs> I was doing a lot of stuff about gender politics and that kind of stuff when I first started out. He really just loved me and then he he came to me. This is exactly how he asked me. This is a true story. It's a little dirty, but Oh, we like um, dirty. <laughs> he he said, uh, "Do you want to come over to Sex in the City?" and tell the women what pussy tastes like because nobody <laughs> here seems to know. Valid point. <laughs> some girls rem- some girls remember vaguely from college, but but nobody has an answer at the time. There was, you know, seven women and two gay men on the staff. Oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> and so and he was legit. That's he was he was for real. So your qualification was that yeah, you so knew I, what that it I had some, like, I had some experience in that area, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember like when I mean this episode, I do remember this episode so vividly. We had Candace Bushnell on the podcast too. We're huge Sex and the City fans. But I remember Miranda feeling so liberated and like wanting to pass the gospel along right. to other women. Why do you think our first inclination is to make so many excuses for these people that we're dating when it's clear if you break it down to simplistic terms like you did? Because I think it's rare to connect, and when you do connect, you you want something to be there and when all of a sudden it disappears you want to look for an excuse for why it wasn't there or how could it suddenly have changed mm. you know i think women tend to be a little bit more optimistic and and hopeful mm-hmm. and uh you know and also n- more nurturing so the nurturing side of that conversation is yeah you know he's probably just busy he, you know what i mean like you're trying to build them up you know but as opposed to just tearing the band-aid off and going well if he hasn't called You mean to tell me that men don't sit around and ask why a girl hasn't texted back or hasn't shown interest? Oh, no, I think they absolutely do. At the time, when we wanted, when we wrote the book originally, we had wanted to do it for both sexes. And the publisher said, Mm. no, men don't care. They're not going to read a book. Make it for women. Huh. That's probably what's changed one of the most of this time, right? If we were to rewrite this in 2020, because you know, dateable listeners, we have about 60% women, 40% men, mm-hmm. which greatly surprised you and I when we yeah. first started mm-hmm. this. Because similar to your publishers, we're like, no men are going to listen to this. And I think a lot of men have very similar like challenges with dating, you know, and different sexualities have different challenges mm-hmm. with dating. I think maybe like if we were to do this 2020 it would be like they're just not that into you yeah you know? yeah a little more gender fluid there <laughs> it had to come out in the time frame that it came out when it came out because it came out then then it leads to other things then it becomes something else at this point you wouldn't you could write a book they're not that into you i'm so you know you you would you could write easily but it sort of was a it felt like it was part of a whole woman's mo- moment of being clear, of a clarity for women. Mm. You know, I just happened to ride in on that crest, you know, with a female author whose idea it was to write the book in the first place. So you have to understand that, like, mm-hmm. I didn't see this as a book. I was like, there's no book. How can there be a book in this? It's just obvious <laughs> stuff. But Liz, the co-author, and my wife really pushed for it and encourage me to to follow through with it and do the book with them. Yeah, that is, that is so 
typical of the conversations I had in like the early 2010s, right? I just feel like those were the mm-hmm. conversations I had sitting around with girlfriends being like, oh, you know, he's busy at work and he's his mother is in town, just making up all kinds of shit just to make me feel better, like he's still interested. But then on the flip side is all my guy friends would sit around and be like, oh yeah, no, she's definitely not interested. They're like much quicker to go th- the opposite yeah. and say, yeah. oh yeah, she's just not interested. Move, move on. And so those conversations were happening, but they were just very different conversations. And I do think those conversations are very different today. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I think that totally makes sense. This was like at the shift of, you know, the women's movement with that. And so much of our making these excuses, I feel like stem from Cosmo and like bad dating advice and why men love bitches and like all those books that came Mm -hmm. out for so long. It's interesting paradigm shift now because I think men and women may be like closer in the way they think about things more than ever now because women essentially became more empowered because Mm -hmm. of books like yours, for instance. And then men, I think, have also like dropped some of their guard a bit, show the emotional side a bit more now than ever before, too. So it's kind of interesting, like how those lovers have played out. Yeah, totally. And and I also think, you know, dating isn't as cut and dry as it used to be. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot more hanging out. I feel like women do a lot more of the asking than they used to. Yep, for sure. You know, society set up just a little bit. You know, it used to be men ask women out. That's just how, that's how I was raised. You know, right, so right, that's, right. All, that's all I understood was if a guy isn't asking you out, he's not interested because that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. I was just going to say on that note, because Julie loves timelines and I love that she outlined this for us. For all <laughs> you listeners, if you want to just think back on when this book was written, it was written in 2004. The movie came out in 2009 and now we're in 2021. So in the book, you, you have a list. He's just not that into you if X, Y, and Z. So let's go through the list and maybe let's talk about, are there any on this list that you would update for 2021? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's all the same. No, okay. No, I don't think so. I mean, you could add, I mean, he's not that into you if he's a fuck boy. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a part of our dialogue back then. The fuck boy wasn't a thing, you know, when we were writing the book. I feel like players were the old fuck boys. Like, I feel like mm-hmm. it just got yeah, really brand. Yeah, players. <laughs> It was players. <laughs> like when I was on Oprah, she brought on dudes that were players. I remember like one of my friends was like, what's a fuck boy? And I'm like, it's a player. It's a yeah. Basically, of our generation. But it's also. Yeah. But That's it's a funnier also, term. But fuck boy also accepts the fact that this guy fucks around. Like a player, a player sounds like a disingenuous human being. A fuck boy is what he is. Yeah. That's true. Right. The, that's, that's, that's what he is. He, there's, it's no apologies. Player is sort of an apology in a way, but, but fuck boy is really like, you know, I just, I'm a, you know, I fuck around. That's a good point. A player, yeah, a player is incognito. Yeah. And, and a fuck boy is decept- waving that flag. <laughs> Yeah, totally. (laughs) Owning it. I love it. So, okay. So our first one on the list, he's just not that into you if he's not asking you out. We kind of talked about this, that it is more socially acceptable for women to ask out men this day and age. I do think there is something to this, though. Like, I think I'm all for women making the first move and asking out. But I think if you're the only person doing it over and Mm. over again, like, he's just not that into you. I think that is a clear and true statement. And I don't know. I feel like... Like sometimes we make so many excuses, but if someone wants to hang out, they're, they're gonna, gonna the make the plan. Yeah, they want to hang out. They want to be with you, you know, so they'll they'll figure it out. And the rest on this list too, we can go through just a few of them quickly. He's just not that into you if he's not calling you in today's day and age. Probably he's not texting you or communicating with you or mm-hmm. FaceTiming you, whatever that may be. Sliding into your DMs. Is this like <laughs> yeah, making any sort of connection with you, right? And uh, he's just not that into you if he's not dating you what does that mean if he's not making it if he's not dating you if he's not actually calling them dates if he's not making it sort of official if, uh, he's, not, if he's not seeing also if he's not seeing you you know there are women that make whole cloth relationships out of people that they know from work i almost feel like this one's gotten worse in 2021 mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah because people aren't dating. yeah there's a lot of hanging out a lot of hanging out a lot of ambiguity 
on both sides yes. and people are afraid to ask for clarity. Mm-hmm. And what we were always telling women, it was okay for you to ask for clarity. Yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. Why do you think that people like, you know, stay with people that aren't making that official? Because I think it is such common sense. Like if he's not calling you his girlfriend or she's not calling you her boyfriend, yeah, that means something. Yet we hear all, I think some of the, the biggest questions you and I get are from people that are trying to make something work that isn't. Like, why do you think we're even doing that i think people are so grateful in in love that somebody sh- is showing attention to them that they're afraid there's nothing else out there for them yes you know what i mean they don't we don't use the same parameters as we would use everywhere else in life you know and so we have this like well fuck but it you know but he does come over and he does you know he did spend the night two weeks ago so yeah <laughs> you know yeah. It's so interesting, though. We always hear that, you know, um, paradox of choice is a problem with dating apps because there's so many people out there, yet we have the scarcity mindset so much. Like, why do we? All the time. Why do we think that? I don't know. Because we don't believe, all of us don't believe that we're worthy of love or deserve love or can have love, you know? Or know what it looks like. We haven't seen it yet. So we think this is what love is Mm. because we haven't seen it yet. We haven't had a really good, you know, and when you finally have that really good example of love, you generally lock it down. And what's the general consensus of the statement? Because I can see some of our listeners reading deep Mm -hmm. into the statement saying, oh, he's just not that into you. But he's still somewhat into you. Well, that's why we put the, that's why we put the, that, he's just not that into you, which means he's showing you some, right. you're getting little bits and pieces and crumbs, but you're not getting the whole piece. You're not getting the whole slice. And so the lesson to be learned is you want someone who is that yeah. into you, right? Mm-hmm. Like we want the whole pie. You don't want just crumbs. So let's just stop this thinking of, well, the statement is just, he's not that into you. Well, you do want someone yeah. who is that into you that should be the goal it almost doesn't matter why either like i think so so many times we get hung up on like oh they're just busy at work or they're getting over something or they're going through something in their life and i know i've been there here before also Mm -hmm. that like i did have an ex that i do believe like did truly care about me but he maybe wasn't just that into me in the sense that like he couldn't right. make it really work i definitely was in that period that i would justify a lot of things for that reason but at the same time like if that's not what you want either like what's the point of even making those justifications like even if it's legit like who cares yeah no totally so some of the other statements on your list they're pretty I feel like they're pretty common sense. He's just not that into you. He's not having sex with you. Doesn't want to have sex with you. Having sex with someone else. uh, He's breaking up with you. He's married or in other relationships or he's a selfish jerk or bully or really big freak. But there's also some statements that I think are not as obvious. For example, he's just not that into you if he's disappeared on you. In today's terms, he's ghosted you or that he uh, is not. What's the other one? He wants he only sees you when he's drunk. That's another one that I think when we look at these patterns, maybe it's not so obvious. But if you look at it over a course of time, yes, that's pretty obvious. Uh, So what do we what do we do in these situations when it appears? What do we do? Do we just get rid of the person or do we confront them? What is the next course of action? Well, I think once you've noticed a pattern, then then you owe it to the person to bring it up at least and say, look, this is something I'm noticing. I'm not really crazy about it. Uh, it makes me think that you really aren't that into me. Give them an opportunity to either defend themselves or get help. You know, there are many variety of things that they could respond to. And then if it comes back up again, then it's time to pack it up. I think the only thing here, I totally agree on most, you know, heteronormative relationships. I totally think all of these hold true, even in 2021. I think the one thing maybe around like the sex piece, he's just not that into if he's having sex with someone else. Like there are a lot of people that have open arrangements or, you know, polyamorous arrangements. So I think there's some of that has probably adapted a bit in current times. Yeah, I would I would amend that to say unless the construct of your relationship is different. Right. Right. If you have that kind of a relationship, then you have that understanding. So that's not even that's not one you would consider, you know, and some of these, you know, remember, we were trying we were trying we're two TV writers. So we were trying to be funny. You know, there was there's a, a big attempt in this book to be almost ironic. about 
Yeah, and that makes sense. But also, it became such a popular book and movie that yeah. I think it became almost the Bible for some people. Oh my god, I, <laughs> I've heard I've heard people say that. I definitely did not know that you were like a comedian when I read that book. I thought it was written well and it was funny, but I thought it was like a dating expert kind of giving this advice. Yeah, no, we were really clear. I think even the book we say at the beginning, we're both two TV writers. And this book is just our opinion. <laughs> this is just this is our experience and what what we've gleaned from just our own dating lives, you know, and what we know from life. So as a married man, working on Sex in the City, writing this book, you've been in the writer's room with a bunch of women who have probably told you all of their love life stories. Mm -hmm. What is your take on modern dating today? It's really hard for me to have a take without actually being a person dating. You know, like Kane. Kane was my connection to dating for a while. Now he's with somebody. I would encourage, you know, I was constantly like, are you on the apps and doing and what's that like? And what, you know, tell me how a, how an interaction goes and how, when do you know to follow up and how soon do you get on FaceTime with somebody? And, you know, I was really interested in what his experience and what the opening lines were and what the opening gambit was. When he knew he was, how do you stop when you don't want to be with anybody, anymore, you know, or you don't want to interact with them anymore. You know, I was just really curious about what that was like, because I have no idea, you know. Well, you guys get a ton of people writing in on Don't Take Bullshit from Fuckers. Yeah. And I feel like you should just give them a copy of your book for most of it. Like, <laughs> Yeah, right. Like, I guess, like, when people write you this stuff, like, what goes through your mind? Like, they always think they think they have the story that proves me wrong. Mm. Like, well, my story's different. And then you're like, no, your story's exactly the same. <laughs> always. It's the same as every other story that I've yes. read. It's always yeah. the same. We get the same. And the longer, the longer the email, the <laughs> worse it is. Right. Yes. Yes. You know, if it's like three or four paragraphs, it's like this thing Because is they think the details make it unique. And, and you get them too. I'm sure you do yes. too. You get emails that are like, scroll, scroll, scroll. Yeah. We love reading them, though. <laughs> so I definitely agree with like the majority of it. I think I I can see this in my current relationship where it's just so easy. And it makes me be like, why did I stand for things that weren't easy? And when people talk about things that aren't easy, you're like, what are you doing? But at the same time, humans are involved. And I think like, for instance, like even, you know, if someone doesn't call you back right away, or there's something there, they could be just doing some other facet of life. Like, how do you balance? that with this statement we we tried to be we used to be really clear in the book we were trying to be really clear in the book we're not saying a guy forgets to call you and then you just toss him out you know but we're like when it starts to crop up and you find yourself telling your girlfriends you know he never calls me back or he only texts me in one word answers or you know when it when it when it becomes something you're discussing then it's time to look at that is that a red is that a red flag you know, otherwise, you know, we're not, we're not saying being insane. Right. You know, we're not saying like, he didn't call me Greg. So I told him to go fuck himself. <laughs> you know, we're not encouraging that kind of behavior at all. But when it becomes something that comes up, you know, more than a few times, then it's time to look at it for what it is so that you don't waste time. Right. So it's patterns more than one offs. It's patterns. Yeah, it's patterns. And it's, and it's repeat offending. And you know, it's all that. It's all that kind of stuff. If you woke up single tomorrow, and you had to date, like you, someone forced you to mm -hmm. date, how would you do it differently than what people are doing today? I, how would I do it? I have no, I, I have no idea. <laughs> well, I'd start looking around my A, A meetings <laughs> to see who was hot. A, -A meetings? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's like people that you would meet in public as opposed to on an app, you know, and people with common and similar interests and people that are on a similar life path to you. So something like that. I wouldn't go to bars because I don't drink. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's something sad about that. And I think there's something sad about open bars. And uh, I guess I would maybe get on the apps, although they seem depressing. <laughs> they seem so it's a good thing you're married. Yeah. Hold on to her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't want to date right now. I think that was an interesting one on the list that we didn't hit is that if they're not wanting to marry you, they're just not that into you. Like as someone married, do you still feel that like holds true? Because I feel like a lot of people have different views on marriage. So what do you think today, Day? That's a personal preference. If marriage is something that's important to you and they don't want to marry you, that's important. Then you may not have the same goals. You may not be right for each other. 
But is marriage mm -hmm. an, an important thing? I don't know that it is. I don't know that my relationship would be different with my wife if we weren't married. Maybe it would. I mean, I think we would have been through some tough times, so maybe we wouldn't be together. But, uh, but as far as it being a thing that people have to aspire to, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe there's a right answer. You know, as far as marriage goes, people can do whatever they want. So it's more about being on the same page. It's more about being on the same page, yeah. I mean, some people really want to be married. They really want to be a part of that institution. They want the legality. They want the, they want that extra step. They want the ceremony, right. you know? They want that, that thing, and some people don't. Let's hold that thought and take a quick break for a couple of messages. This episode is fueled by Drizzly. How many of you have a full-blown bar in your house? I mean, I wish, but with a Drizzly app, you basically have that at the palm of your hands. Drizzly is the number one app for alcohol delivery because sometimes you need it now, like right now. Some cool features of the Drizzly app include getting drinks delivered to your door in under 60 minutes. I found this super helpful in this virtual world that we live in where it's harder to meet up with friends or coworkers for a drink. So now I just send them drinks. Their selection is also huge. I'm always happy when I can find some Brunello wine or that George Clooney tequila. You know what I'm talking about. And finally, Drizzly connects you to local liquor stores where you can compare prices across all of them. So go check out Drizzly now by downloading the Drizzly app or going to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. And use the promo code SPICE5 for $5 off your first order. That's drizzly.com and use the code SPICE5 for $5 off. Have you ever thought about how much better dating would be if you had a whole army of people supporting you along the way? We know that dating can be frustrating and lonely, but it can also feel fulfilling and fun. Have you recently decided you want to make some changes to your love life? Maybe you've recently re-entered the dating scene. Maybe you've gone on one too many dates that went nowhere. Or maybe you're just ready to take your current relationship to the next level. That is exactly why we created The Sounding Board, a true extension of our podcast that delivers a personalized experience, which includes monthly office hours where you can drop in and chat with us about anything, weekly sound Sound offs with guided discussions and regular virtual happy hours. Allow Julie and I to become your dating Sherpas to provide real time guidance and wisdom in a more intimate way so we can all navigate dating and relationships together. Join the sounding board today by going to datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Again, that's datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Well, Greg, I want to kind of go into Hollywood right now because I feel like you're our resident Hollywood expert. Sure. That we see all all of our love lives are so heavily affected by the media and the movies we watch and the shows that we watch. Mm -hmm. But when we when we are, you know, peeling back the layers, ex especially what you said, what the publishers wanted, what the network wanted, what sells and what doesn't sell in Hollywood when it comes to dating and love? What are the storylines that networks love? I mean, they still seem to go for the same kind of classic heteronormative stories that we hear over and over again. Like marriage. Marriage sells. Marriage? I mean, look at the success of The Bachelor. You know, the show's been on forever. Right. It's heteronormative, beautiful people hanging out together. Most of the world has nothing in common with The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, and we're fascinated with it. I find it so boring, but that's my personal <laughs> take. <laughs> well, I like... I oh, like, we know. I like Fuckboy Island. <laughs> <laughs> Fuckboy Island is pretty darn good. <laughs> why Why do you like it? I think it's fat. Well, I love Nikki Glaser. Let's start there. I love yeah. Nikki. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated with the idea that you can tell whether somebody is or isn't a fuckboy. Like, they're doing all the same kind of he's just not that into you work on the show, trying to figure out whether somebody's legit or not. Yeah. You know, trying to figure out whether yeah. they're the real deal or whether they're running, they're running a story on you. And the fact that they have self-identified fuckboys in with self-identified nice guys is sort of an interesting, yeah. kind of an interesting thing. So while we're talking about Hollywood, I'd love your take on the movie if you're oh, willing yeah. to share it. But I feel like all of the people, you know, kind of stood their ground. Like there was the plot about, you know, the marriage piece and that eventually came around for Jennifer Aniston's character. There was, you know, the plot around the cheater never leaves his wife and that plot actually came to be too. But then the main character kind of ended up with someone that wasn't super 
Like she kind of seemed like she was getting the exception to the rule. Completely. She ble- they, they broke the whole rule of the book. Yeah. So why did that happen? <laughs> Hollywood. It's Hollywood. I didn't, you know, we, Liz and I didn't have a say. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. And we were clear with them about it. We said it kind of, like if he had come back at the end, if when he came back, she said, okay, that's fine. That's a great speech. Now come back and do it every day for the next two or three months and we'll see if I feel differently. You know, she owned the power in the relationship. If she had taken her own instead yeah. of just like, you know, yeah. No, people were mad about that. <laughs> I got a lot of shit for that. But I kind of feel like that's why we all justify shit because like movies, they need like the drama, right? Like they couldn't just be like this guy that just did everything right and gave her no signs of question. And then they ended up together would be no plot. And I think people are looking for the plot in their own lives. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And they're waiting and they're waiting for that turnaround that doesn't really happen. I mean, those two people just shouldn't be together. Yes. And that stuff doesn't happen. Exactly. Because people want control, so they feel like they they have the ability to change somebody and that they'll be able to do something that makes the other person feel different and come back around. I think that people like want the story a lot of times. Like, how do we get people yes. to start seeing that the, you know, the someone that calls you consistently and does all the right actions is interesting and sexy also, not just this person that's unattainable? I don't know. I mean, we are obsessed with the unattainable. You know, we're obsessed with being rich. We're obsessed with being sexy. We're obsessed with all these things that may or may not be attainable. us you know but we love the idea that we're going to someday be really sexy really rich and really attainable (laughs) so are those people just (laughs) fucked then yeah (laughs) yeah i mean i you know it is it's also what your self-worth is it's what you think you deserve and some people think they deserve somebody who's not interested Mm. we just have to separate Hollywood from reality. I think that's right. the problem because you know, people complain about the apps because it's not a good story. Meeting someone on Bumble is not something that you want to brag about because it's not interesting. But meeting someone at the grocery store, yeah, that's an interesting story because we've seen it in movies. But if we can separate the two somehow in our minds and say, that's not reality, it's just entertainment, I think it would make our love lives better. Well, and the thing too is the the reason people don't like, there's nothing cinematic about meeting on an app. Nobody's running through a park to get your attention. Nobody's, you know, standing up at a club and making a big deal. Like it's just somebody responded to your hello or whatever, however it works. And, you know, but that doesn't make it any less valid. Right. It's yep. just as valid. Yep. Exactly. Well, that's a good idea for an app is what if you just like fuck book, fuck, <laughs> fuck boy island. Wow, that's so hard to say. People are self-proclaimed fuck boys. What if we had everybody <laughs> rate themselves on a series of qualities, your kindness quality, your fuck boy meter, and just, you know, like instead of <laughs> listing your height and your eye color, how about that? Mm-hmm. How you describe your own qualities? I don't think that's a bad idea. Yeah. But would people would people be honest? I feel like the most narcissistic people would be like, I'm the best in every quality. Yeah, no, I can't imagine somebody saying, you know, kindness, I'm going to put a four. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a dick. I'm not that yeah. kind. I'm kind of a dick. Hey, some some fu- self proclaimed yeah fuck boys the fuck might, boys will or they know they know to like mess with people that are insecure that are mm-hmm. latching on. Oh, that, that's right? the whole thing. That's what makes them. That's what makes them so deceptive. Is they're so good at the game. Okay, so how do we get people? I feel like this is still the part I'm struggling with. Like, how do we get people to reframe that he's just not that into you is empowering? Kind of like the revelation that Miranda had versus making the justification to say anything but. There's re- there's a real relief in when you say he's just not that into you about whoever, you're releasing them back into the world. They're, suddenly they're not your problem anymore. They're not your problem. There's great power. Mm. There's great power. And like when you've been in something bad for a while and you finally decide to get out of it, as painful as it is, there's a little bit that feels like, ah, good. Good for me. Good for me. I made that choice. I made the right choice. I'm I'm letting go of this person. They're not my concern anymore. I'm not in Mm -hmm. charge of them. They can do whatever they want. They're gone. You know, and I feel like that's something people don't understand. You know, I talk to people all the time. I coach girls all the time and men, but mostly girls who've gone through breakups, recent breakups, and they just don't want to let go. And they're, and they're mm-hmm. trying, 
they they always want me to be able to tell them how long of no contact before they can get back together. Yes. Yeah. Oh my god, always. that is so why people do the no yeah. contact. Yeah, I'm gonna do no contact so that I, so that I so that I get a result and not the result, which is to move on and to you know find other things to occupy your life and your time. I think it goes back to the scarcity mindset again. Yeah. Totally. Because it is hard to find a connection. Yeah, or or that you think that a connection you've had with someone is so special that you're never going to find it again. So you hold on to it when it's probably just something right. you could kind of construed in your mind. I remember in 2009 when this movie came out, I was going through a really hard time of getting over this guy I had dated for three months and I thought he was the one. So when the movie came out, I was like, OK, he's just not that into me right now. <laughs> But if I give it one month of no contact and I just casually do an evening jog past his work and just run into him, that is the cutest story ever. Then we reunite, hopefully in the (laughs) rain. It's all going to work out. That was the narrative I was telling myself in my head. So, yes, in some ways it helped me. Yes. But then I still was creating these stories. For some reason, the stories just really fucked me up yeah and it's and it's just such a common thing that people do and and you're right and you only went out with them for three months but you created this whole world around it persona that probably wasn't really even true you know about this guy and your connection and you know because connections are really rare I think there's a few reasons. Like I can definitely point to er- times in my life that I stood for less than behavior. And I think some of it was that I just wasn't really ready for a real relationship. I didn't know that at the time. But I think like if you really are ready and want someone that, like you said, you know, values you and does all the things and treats you like you should, you wouldn't stand for that behavior in the first place. So I think some of it just might be where you are in time and all of us might experience it. I think as long as you're learning from it and not just repeating it over and over again with a new person, then that just might be like some of it might be part of the course. I think another piece for me was like having there was like a lot of ego that was attached Mm -hmm. to it. Like if all my friends had boyfriends, I wanted someone to talk about Mm -hmm. even if it was if I knew that person wasn't a good partner. And in like retrospect, I'm like, I should have just like tossed that person to the curb and look for someone that actually was a partner. But in the moment, you're kind of like grasping to whatever you have to kind of be part of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And maybe that goes back to not being really ready. I think I think it does. I think I think grow and we start to understand what a relationship really is and what I truly need and what I Mm -hmm. you know what I don't actually need. But I think the movies tell me I need, but I don't really need that. You know, like mm-hmm. I love my wife with all my heart. And I, and the reason I probably wouldn't date is I just don't think I'd find another person like her and I'm not interested in looking. So right. that would just be it for me, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I imagine. But I also, I don't need all the things I thought I needed when I first met her. I thought I needed to be coddled a lot. I thought I needed to be, mm. I thought I needed a lot of affirmation. I thought, and I, I don't, I just need, I just like it with it. She shows up. Hmm. That's enough for me. That's right. the love is right there. She shows up for me, you know, in, in a variety of different ways all day long, every day for years. And there doesn't have to be lots of big grand gestures and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's another thing that we get from the movies that isn't reality also. Well, and people put stock in things like birthdays and anniversaries yes. and all yep. this stuff. And they make it this, they make them these hills that people have to climb. As opposed mm-hmm. to, you know, like we've gone an anniversary without even exchanging a card and then, you know, I'm giving her a tennis bracelet. Like it just, it depends on the year and the time and where we're at, what we're up to, what's going on in our lives with our kids and all the rest of that stuff. And it probably doesn't mean that there's something better or worse going on in your marriage. Not it's at just. All. Yeah, well, because in Hollywood movies, everything culminates to something. There's a climax. And in real life, when we culminate to an event and nothing eventful happens, we are suddenly disappointed (laughs) by really no reason at all other than these movies telling us that it should have been some sort of grand gesture. And then you also mentioned something earlier, too, is that in these movies, because they're only an hour and a half, two hours, there has to be a transformation of a character. There's an art. Mm -hmm. So that happens very fast in movies but in real life people don't change that fast in fact some people don't change at all but for some reason we feel that maybe we have the power to change someone or someone will suddenly change their ways for us 
There's something about nope. romantic comedies, though. One person's always broken and has to get better. Yeah, right. You know, they have a they suffer from a deficiency or a lack or something, and then by the end, they that has been changed. You know, I mean, if you think about it, really, they're not making romantic comedies anymore. I mean, when was the la- what was the last big romantic comedy? No, they're That's not. True. I mean, maybe something on net, maybe something on Netflix. Those ones that that are sort of more geared towards my sixteen year olds. <laughs> yeah, but like you're right, big blockbuster ones. I can't. I guess like La La Land, but they didn't end up together. No, that's like one. I mean, that wasn't even that long ago, but that was no, La La Land. Was, La La Land was very adult. It was. It was a hundred. It was, and I think that the we think we can fix people is why people stay in these situations or situationships that aren't going anywhere. Yeah. That are clearly there. Yeah. La La Land, I think, had one of the best endings ever. Yeah, I thought it was great. Just like what what could have been, but then realizing like that isn't the love between us wasn't necessarily for the long haul. Yeah. Yeah. And he was an insufferable jazz dick. (laughs) (laughs) I think, though, that like, I don't know about you both, but maybe you a more than Greg, since you clearly just had this down from day one. But I feel like going through these people that just weren't that into me. I feel like it changed what I was looking for for a partner. Mm. Like, I remember, like, really wanting someone that was funny. Like, that was really important to me. And I think I've changed that to be, like, someone I can laugh with and enjoy each other's company. And I put, like, a big, a much higher weight on consistency and reliability. And those were things that I definitely weren't even thinking about as qualities in my, like, early 20s and even, like, early 30s. Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, I had music requirements for people that I was dating. Because you know, you're because you're a musician, like, you you're a music eat. snob, right? But then, but now I could give a shit. My wife and I don't listen right. to anything the same, and it doesn't it matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it matters. It matters none at all. It matters not at all. Well, because in Hollywood, again, going back to Hollywood, these movies tell you you have to have standards, but those standards are oftentimes superficial standards because that's what you you can Mm -hmm. depict in movies. That's what's entertaining. But when it comes to relationships, our standards should be based on feelings. I think since this movie came out, I had to reshift how I feel, how someone makes me or what someone does to Mm -hmm. make me feel like they are that into me. And it's always a gut check because we right. know when someone's just not that into you like we know we just have to check back and say okay well this person's not definitely not making me feel like they're that into me yeah right totally usually like when we're attached to these people that aren't that into you a lot of it is because we're grasping the superficial checklist mm-hmm. and i think like you're right that hollywood that's how it visually depicts and i think dating apps have the same problem we've totally. talked about this before that that you can't show someone's kindness levels no. like on a dating app you show that they're six four or you know went to stanford or whatever like you know thing that's kind of like bragging rights that ultimately doesn't mean anything either i'm so glad that we're able to to rehash this book slash movie slash like everything because I think at the end of the day even in 2021 the same principles apply they do and I I think like my biggest takeaway from this conversation is a lot of times we try to overthink everything with dating Mm -hmm. and when we get into the pattern of overthinking and overanalyzing that's usually a sign that they're not just that into you I think that the relationships that flow the most effortlessly or the ones that you know you can be your authentic self and say what you need to do and not worry about these things like that's when they are that into you and I love this like we we keep saying this it's like the feeling that you get if you break it down logically Mm -hmm. and try to like step out of I'm in this situation and would I give my friend this advice? Like, why would you want to be with someone where you're the one that's making all the plans or you never think they're going to text you back or right. whatever that might be? Like, I think we need to kind of look th- things and it's hard, it's way easier said than done. But instead of getting defensive, like really be like, what do I want? I think mm-hmm. so much of the time we've talked to people in these situations, it's all about the other person. But I think it needs to come back to you. And usually what we've seen, once people like let that person go, they usually end up finding someone that is that into them. Yeah, no, totally. That is what happens. It's a, Good relationships are also wildly uncinematic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're dull. Yeah. 
they're they're not interesting to hear about. You know, people get along and then they fuck and they love each other and they <laughs> they do stuff together. And when they don't want to do stuff together, they don't do stuff together. And you know, they figure out how to have friends and family and all the rest of that stuff. And it's just you know, and it's in a constant negotiation all the time. But it's you know, but it's it's not uh, it's not traumatic and all over the place. That's so true. I I think that's such an important takeaway that like we need to stop creating this storyline. Like let the storyline play out of just two people doing life together. It doesn't need to be this roller coaster that we're that we feel like we need to go to be on to make this big story. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that was going to be my biggest takeaway too, is I think we can always pause and ask, am I looking for a partner? to co-star in a rom-com or my partner to co-star in my real life. And I think that's always a good way to yeah. filter someone's actions. Is this person's actions someone mm-hmm. something that's feeding into the movie in my head or in real life? And when you your answer is movie, it probably means that they have pretty erratic behavior because in these movies, their behavior is all over the place because that's what keeps these movies entertaining. Things are constantly happening. And that's they've got to put they've got to put something in the trailer. They right? Yes, there's got to be some running. There has to be some <laughs> running. Doors have to be slammed. <laughs> Crying. And then you're like, do I do I want that in real life? No. <laughs> Glasses need to be raised. You know, it's 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 such a thing. And then you realize, no, that's a movie. That's what a movie does. Yeah. You know, right. Tom Cruise comes running in at the last minute and then declares that you're my other half and whatever, you know, like it you know, they're dramatic. Yeah. It's kind of like how we can, I think a lot of people are able to separate porn from sex as like more entertainment versus reality. But I think we need to do the same for dating with movies. Like it's the same thing. It's just a different side of the coin. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And we need to understand what that into you means it doesn't need to be the big gestures but it does mean well baseline is that they're not an asshole so all the things that you would expect a kind normal human being to do that's just baseline and then anything a little bit above that means that they probably are that into you for for my partner something mm-hmm. that he did for me today that I feel like this this man truly loves me is that we switch cars and he put the car the dog car seat in my car because he knew that I would have to transport the dogs. <laughs> he did that in the morning. I know that they would never write that into a movie because people would fall asleep and be like, this is the dumbest movie ever. But right. in my real movie, real life movie, I was like, this man fucking loved me. He thought about me today. No, that's a, that's 100% it. It's all that little stuff that mm-hmm. when you look at it really adds up to being something so much bigger than whatever the big gesture is you're looking for. Yeah, I think the whole like the boring movie, because I like think about that too in my current relationship that I feel like is a very solid relationship. I'm like, I, there's nothing to talk about. <laughs> like there's nothing to bring up. It's a up good thing. <laughs> besides that, you know, and I think that's, it's important. And I think we should have grace though, if we're not in that place right now. Like UA and I have both been in situations where someone was just not that into us. And I think it teaches you what you'll not stand for in the future if you choose to learn from it. It's some of it's inevitable that you're going to have this happen. A lot of it's just growing and, you know, be- realizing your worth, essentially. Right. But I think where it becomes problematic is if you're in situation after situation, that's a different face and name, but it's the same thing happening, just a different variation of the story. And then at that point, maybe it's time to like, like look into therapy or really analyze like why am I doing what I'm doing if I truly want a committed relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. So Greg, what are some things yeah. you're working on currently other than your podcast with Kane? I'm really interested in creating a rally, reality show and I haven't figured out exactly what oh. that is yet. But I've oh. been watching I've been watching a lot of dating reality shows and I'm trying to figure out <laughs> how to create myself. Okay. I'm so very you inspired. You like all yeah. the islands, Fuckboy Island, Love Island, probably Temptation Island. Any other <laughs> uh, any other reality shows other than The Bachelor? We've talked about that, too. Any other ones that have been on your radar? Well, I love all the cooking ones, too. Mm, okay. Yeah, I love all of them. I mean, I, I, like, I like a lot of reality television. I feel like there's something with cooking and dating. That that's what I'm, that's that. what I'm thinking of. Yes. There are three reality, dating reality shows in the works just because I get all the casting calls for them. One is uh, uh, your mom plays the matchmaker. So your mom goes on the date 
with your potential date. And then she decides who you actually get to date. So that's one that's coming out. Another one is... Didn't they have that? Do they already? Maybe it's a different I like season. MT- I feel like that was an MTV show from like a zillion years oh, ago. I mean... Like date my mom or something. Was I it? would never trust my mom to find my mate. But hey, some people might. <laughs> no. The second one that's coming yeah. out is some sort of dance show where you learn a dance with your blind date and you don't get to see them. That, that I think everyone's masked, but and you learn a dance together and that at the end you evaluate each other on their partnership skills, something like that. So that's the second one. And then the third one is something about people love exes, but I think this is like you've set up your exes. You set up your ex with someone else's ex. Those are the three that I know are coming out. Wow. Okay. If that's any inspiration wow, for some- you. <laughs> Okay. No, it's good. I like to know. I want to know what's going on. You know, I want to know what people, what, what, what the room temperature is. In the meetings I've had lately, everybody wishes they bought Fuckboy Island. Really? Everybody is like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's sort of why. The, that's the, because people like it. People love the word fuckboy too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They like how the show breaks convention. I think they just like, everybody likes to get good looking people in bathing suits. <laughs> That is the key. That is essentially the key to reality success. That get, is not the key to that is not the key to finding a long term partner no, in the real not world. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> but in reality television, if you can get anybody into a bathing suit, you're in good shape. <laughs> oh, there is such a disconnect from reality TV. It should not even be called reality for TV. Oh, no, I know. No kidding. Watch. Yeah. This is the, the farthest thing from reality TV. The opposite of reality. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so entertaining though. Well, thank you so much, Greg. We were so happy to have you oh on. God, this, this has so been fun. such a fun convo. Yeah, it's been awesome. You guys are great. And for anybody who wants to check out Don't Take Bullshit from Fuckers, your podcast with Kane Holloway, where can they find that podcast? Mm-hmm. On any one of the fine Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, all that kind of stuff. And then I'm It's Gregor's on Instagram. And, uh, and I coach. I coach people. So if that's interesting to you, if you want a coaching session, just DM me at It's Gregor's and we'll set something up. Or go to my website, gregorybarrent.com, and there's coaching information there. So you teach people how to not take bullshit from fuckers. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a lot of people need that. That's yeah. the way to that's the way to crack this. He's just not that into you case. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can just see Greg in these sessions just being like, What the fuck are you doing? Don't take that bullshit. He's obviously not that into you. <laughs> <laughs> that should be your reality show. I always say to him, Do you want me to do you want me to say it now? Do you want me to say it now? Okay. <laughs> He's just not that into you. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they do the session just to get you just to, to say hear me that. to say it. Okay, let me say it. Let me do it. That's why you called. This is why you're paying an hourly rate. He's just not that into you. Money well spent. That is a good final takeaway that I think if we start to reframe, he's just not that into you as, you know, ego crushing to it's paving the way for someone that is that into you. I think that will really help liberate us with that statement. And like you said, it's patterns. It's not one off. So yeah, I think people could maybe misuse that statement. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Yeah. And throw them back into the ocean where they could potentially find someone better suited for them. Why hang on to those fuckers? Right. Let them swim to Fuckboy Island. Yeah. Let them swim to Fuckboy Island. Exactly. That is the best way to wrap this up. Thank you again, Greg, for being on our show. (laughs) And for all of our listeners, we would really love it if you got on Podcast Review Island with us. Just go into (laughs) Apple Podcasts and give us five stars. If you give us five stars, then we we can send you a recording of Greg saying, he's just not that into you. That's our gift to you. (laughs) That's our gift with purchase. We'll just play that on repeat. Yeah. (laughs) Just you should go to bed every night with that. You should... that should be your thing. You should make like a meditation app. I was, for a while, I used to make. I know. <laughs> I have a meditation. There's a. If you sign up to my website, if you if you uh, if you sign up to get the emails, you get a free meditation that is "Don't take oh. bullshit from fuckers." Perfect. There you go. Already covered. Already done. And it's a it's a whole thing. It's really funny. It's really funny and fun. Brilliant. Love I'm going to download that tonight and fall asleep to it. <laughs>
Oh, you'll like it. It's got music, the whole thing. It's great. Oh, it's got music? Yes, I'm done. I'm done. Yes. Yeah. So there. Yeah. It's like the new words of affirmation that <laughs> totally. you need to listen to every day. 100%. You'll dig it. You'll dig it. You should totally lead like seminars. <laughs> oh, we, I do. I do sometimes. Yeah, it's fun. That's great. Awesome. Well, on that note, we're going to wrap this up. Stay, Stay dateable. dateable. The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag Stay Dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. I'm Katie Grossman, the ultra marathon runner sponsored by New Balance. I'm also a creative professional, wife, and mom. Life has gotten crazy, especially after battling a tumor, but running still improves my life, both physically and mentally. Go beyond the run at newbalance.com.